I'm very happy to be invited here for somebody from uh, Ultima Thule, Norway, sort of outside of the <coughs> Catholic world. We were missionary territory for something called the North Pole Mission until I think <laughs> the this last century. And we have 2% Catholics uh, and one Catholic high school, no university or anything of the sort. It is uh, indeed a great uh, great and important thing for me to be here and uh, be among the brainiest of American Catholic scholars. Uh, I'm going to try to discuss uh, conditions for the just peace, not to just war, uh, notably. And uh, of course, I am. Uh, uh, it's a bit difficult, this topic, because on the one hand, it is what the encyclica is about, just peace. Uh, at all levels. Uh, at the same time, there is very little about peace, the first condition of peace, one may say, namely the absence of war. Uh, but I will try to bring this together, uh, if possible, and uh, if not possible, I shall leave it to my, my uh, co-speaker to make the good conclusions. So let's give it a try. Now, this is um, uh, a device, the, uh, the uh, PowerPoints that uh, in the French Ecole de Guerre, they say only Americans and teenagers use PowerPoints. <laughs> I'm not American and uh, not a teenager, but uh, I will have to make an exception. Uh, when this uh, encyclica uh, was published, it was at the time of grave international crisis. Uh, it was published, as we know, right after the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, and uh, these were extremely dramatic times. Uh, the world was on the verge of nuclear war, and we know now from, uh, from uh, the opening of archives that uh, it, it, uh, an accident may have happened, might have happened, uh, or one might have used nuclear arms intentionally at the time. So it was just as critical and grave as we have been uh, suspecting it to be. At this time, decolonization uh, was underway, many new states. The UN changed from being a Western-dominated organization to becoming one uh, with a majority of uh, African states, a former col colonial states, non-aligned uh, movement. Uh, human rights did not matter much in international affairs, in politics, I think we can date the time of uh, Carter's presidency when human rights were, con were consciously introduced in international uh, politics. And particularly the time after 1990 is where we find a real impact of human rights. So this is a time where human rights have been codified uh, and uh, also as legal conventions, uh, but they do not have a great impact in the day-to-day should one say, brutal international affairs of, of, of power politics. These are also times with a steady economic rise of, um, of GDP, of income, uh, of consumption. Uh, the French called it uh, les 30 glorieuses, the 30 years of glory, so to speak, with an incremental growth each year. And the welfare state is thriving in Europe. Uh, there is a sort of compromise between market and welfare. At the same time, uh, the north-south gap uh, of, uh, of economic inequality is discovered more and more by governments. So um, the uh, international uh, aid or development aid is entering as a major part of policy. Uh, how is the just peace defined? It is based on what I call the trinity of human rights, rule of law, and democracy. And as for the theologians here, we'll recognize that in the trinity, God is the, most, is the, is the key of, uh, for the rest of the trinity, and that is uh, human rights in this analogy. Human rights, if you read uh, the declaration, clearly imply democracy, clearly imply, uh, implies uh, rule of law. And states that are democratic have uh, a peaceful conflict resolution, which is another condition for the just peace in the encyclica. Uh, and they do not, as I will explain to you later, use force aggressively for the pursuit of national interests, for the most part, 
at least. So the just peace is much more complex, much more demanding uh, than one would at face value think it to be. And yesterday we heard the quotations uh, from the encyclica, peace on earth can never be established, never guaranteed except by the diligent observance of the divinely established order, the tra uh, tranquillitas ordinis, the order that is metaphysical, ontological, and um, uh, this order uh, has, uh, as is also said in the encyclica, the implication that human community is basically spiritual. Human society demands, it's, it reads, that men be guided by justice, respect for rights of others, and do their duty. And duty is, of course, what we owe, owe somebody. Um, that's why we pay duties and taxes. It demands, too, that they be animated by such love as will make them feel the needs of others as their own. That is caritas as solidarity, and induce them to share their goods with others, we must think of human society as being primarily a spiritual reality. With that quotation, uh, I, as a student uh, of this dismal science, not of economics, but political science, the dismal science of international affairs, in a way I shrink from the task of trying to apply this to uh, to, to the world's or relations between states, because this is so far from uh, the reality of, uh, of uh, the primacy of power in the state system, as we could say. So peace as the absence of war, uh, the sort of bottom line criterion for peace, uh, hardly counts or figures in the encyclica, but uh, for us, who have practiced international affairs and diplomacy and studied uh, the mere idea of creating uh, stability in the world, the absence of war, uh, is such a tall order. This is what uh, lawyers and uh, international lawyers and politicians, diplomats have tried to do for centuries. So there is a certain, uh, should one say, one goes from the sublime ideal to the reality of, uh, of international affairs in a one big step, in a way, in this analysis of mine, if not in the encyclica. Uh, in part three of the encyclica, we have the relations between states, which is one of the layers of order. And inside a state, inside man, and I am not, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't feel obliged to say inside men and women, uh, because man to, to, uh, to in, in proper English means uh, the human being. Uh, inside man there is supposed to be an order uh, that corresponds to uh, the Imago Dei. Uh, between men in society there is supposed to be uh, an order uh, based on the order inside uh, the human being. Between states, there is then supposed to be an order also based uh, on um, the proper order. And the proper order uh, is then called human rights uh, in this encyclica. It is, uh, uh, in a way, human rights without order, as we have discussed, uh, are not proper human rights in, in, in the Catholic sense, uh, or in the sense intended here. Um, and uh, human rights with its concomitant uh, democracy, rule of law, uh, is then the basis for relations between states. Now this is very, very different from sovereignty traditionally understood as being, um, as not interfering with or being concerned with form of government inside a state. This is a negation of the Westphalian concept of sovereignty, but as I will show you that concept has luckily changed uh, over the decades after this encyclica. So peace then uh, is the just order uh, between states as defined, uh, but it is also uh, the absence of war in the encyclica. There is a discussion of nuclear arms and uh, the statement that um, uh, the terror balance uh, can never be accepted. People are in the grip of constant fear. It is said, 
um, even if nobody wants to start a nuclear war intentionally, it may happen, come about uh, by chance, chance or un of unforeseen circumstances. And if you read the papers about North Korea these days, then you will see that uh, both those possibilities or rather risks uh, are present today uh, as we speak. Now, uh, how do we empirically try to uh, ascertain, that's what I'm going to do, whether we correspond in a way to these conditions for the just peace today, more so or um, um, differently from 1963 or perhaps 2003, which is another point in time where uh, a pope uh, reflects on this topic. Uh, let me then try to uh, look at uh, the just peace uh, as it was commented on in uh, 2003 uh, and 1963. In 1963 in the encyclica we read about the progress in awareness of human rights, which has been commented on earlier today from 1948 to the time of writing in 63 there is a growing awareness of human rights among politicians, governments, uh, academics, etc. And the church embraces the concept fully in this encyclical. Uh, but at the same time, peace as the absence of war is not at all ensured in 63. We are at the height of the balance of terror. Uh, there is, in a way, uh, it's, it's almost as if Dr. Strangelove, one of the films I recommend my students to see, is almost uh, um, coming through. It, it is a terrible moment in modern history. And a nuclear war is, uh, it was a real possibility of risk. Uh, so the Pope says, in an age that boasts of its, economic, of its atomic power, it no longer makes sense to maintain that war is, is a fit instrument with which to repair the violation of justice. It would seem here that he rules out just war entirely, but the sentence or conclusion is directly tied to uh, nuclear power and the nuclear arsenal. So in 63 uh, he mentions the progress on human rights awareness, uh, women's rights, uh, workers' rights, rights of peoples, that is decolonization, but uh, mentions also uh, the horror of nuclear war and the balance of terror. If we move to uh, f the 40th anniversary, uh, the Pope, Pope John Paul writes about in his, uh, in his statement on peace, uh, in January 2003, he writes about an unprecedented awareness and consciousness um, of human rights, that human rights have, um, have had, I quote, significant progress has been made over the past 40 years. Uh, the fact that states all over the world feel obliged to honor the ideas of human rights show how powerful are the tools of moral conviction. A splendid moment in history after the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall, after the liberation of Eastern uh, Central European states, uh, 1990s onwards, it is the peace, uh, it, it, it's really a peace, peaceful time where Francis Fukuyama even declares the end of history. So it's a time where one can expect almost a march of human rights and liberal democracy in the world, uh, propelled by Western powers who are powerfully, uh, who are at the top of the sort of uh, economic power in the world. So in 2003, uh, it is very interesting that, uh, that one can say here is real progress. And let us look at a couple of the things that happen a wedding human rights, so to speak, to security policy. And uh, if I manage to do that, this seems to be uh, very difficult for women to manage this, uh, this low technology, so we're better at high tech probably. So three, I want to, uh, to emphasize three things that happen. First of all, democracy uh, becomes more of an entitlement than ever before. 
in the sense that sovereignty is increasingly conditioned by democracy and human rights. Legally speaking, this is contested still, uh, that one can uh, condition sovereignty, but through soft law, through political declarations, through the work of the UN, uh, and particularly through the work in Europe of the EU, Council of Europe, even NATO, uh, the conditionality for new members is that they are democracies. Uh, and uh, this conditionality is exercised as a form of foreign policy uh, whereby one admits new members. In 97, NATO admits the East, and Cent East Central European states as members. In 2004, the EU has this tremendous enlargement of 10 states, out of which are from this region. Uh, Council of Europe doubles its membership to 46, I think it is today, uh, and all these uh, members have to uh, uh, obey the uh, or abide by the European Convention of Hum Human Rights and, and the Court of Human Rights. So we can say that this decade from 1990 onwards uh, to perhaps 2000, something like that, these two decades, uh, this decade, sorry, is really one of human rights expansion. The Trinity is promoted in international affairs by the US and Europe in tandem. International Criminal Court is established, a supranational court um, that has mandate a competence in uh, in, um, for genocide and crimes against humanity uh, and war crimes. This is a court that has recently started to function. And the UN, although not calling it democratization, certainly promotes good governance uh, throughout the world. So, uh, and in addition, uh, development aid we can show empirically becomes conditional upon human rights from about mid-1995. So here is a clear translation of human rights uh, conditionality into international, mainstream international affairs. And this extends also to security policy. Uh, should, yes, uh, one has uh, what we call the democratic peace thesis in international uh, affairs, and that is uh, the thesis that democracies do not fight each other, although they do fight uh, sometimes other states, uh, and that there is, um, uh, with the form of government, one promotes peace. And this fits very well with the just peace ideas of the encyclica. Kant's Som Ewigen Frieden was a very early exponent of this idea. He observed that monarchies were often very bellicose, uh, but he observed that trading republics that traded, were interested in trade, not in war warfare, uh, they had interests of, uh, of integration with each other, interdependence. So he uh, said that to get lasting peace, we must have republics that are trading and that are rule, uh, that are Rechtsstaat, that are rule of law, that promote rule of law. So here's something for the lawyers. Uh, so we have in Europe, and uh, the EU got the Nobel Peace Prize uh, last year, as you know, in Oslo. Sometimes we do something in the world. Uh, and that was simply, that was really because it has promoted the integration, peace through integration, particularly enlargement. Uh, and um, uh, one has a whole literature on uh, uh, the security community idea that through integration, uh, through building trust, states trust each other and therefore uh, military force between states in Europe today is unthinkable, and it hasn't been like that. It's a recent thing, if you think back historically, it's been the opposite. Whereas if you move just to the Ca Caucasian region, Middle East, Asia, Asia the best example, there is, a, there is a complete distrust between states. One doesn't trust each other in diplomacy. In uh, Pacta sunt servanda, one doesn't trust the norm, and therefore uh, arms spirals uh, are developing. So this is a trust is a key issue in all diplomacy. So we see in this period that really uh, Europe becomes the example of uh, peaceful 
sort of a peaceful community built on exactly these values. Uh, and the democratic peace theory is well validated in empirical research. Democracies do not go to war against one another. Yet we see on the rims of Europe uh, this very interesting example of Russia being a realpolitik uh, country, respecting and using hard power. And when it intervenes in Georgia in 2008, we are all shocked uh, because we are so unused to this kind of traditional um, great power politics, spheres of interest and geopolitical reasoning. And even NATO hadn't considered that expanding to Georgia might be problematic if you are, uh, if you are entertaining different ideas than, than just uh, sort of the democratic peace. So military, the military alliance NATO was quite naive in its uh, propositions of including Georgia without having considered the strategic implications. Uh, human security, responsibility to protect. This is another variant, so to speak, on the same theme, uh, namely that uh, uh, in the event of genocide, mass atrocity, um, terrible things done to civilians, should one stand by or should one intervene? Uh, we will speak more about this uh, probably in the discussion, but uh, it is remarkable that in, uh, in, the, um, uh, in this period we have a steady development of a norm marrying the right to physical integrity, uh, basic human right, to security policy, uh, namely should one intervene against a tyrant, should one intervene uh, to save people from mass atrocity. Uh, and this is the big debate, humanitarian intervention in the 90s, and there are in fact some such interventions. Somalia 92, Kosovo 99, um, Libya even today. Uh, but we have a lot of political work at the UN in this decade. High level report, uh, Brent Scowcroft led that work uh, on the UN called um, uh, towards a more secure world, uh, where Catholic just war criteria are in fact uh, the basis, I don't know whether it was conscious or not, but they resemble uh, almost uh, completely the criteria, six criteria of responsibility to protect, which is a new norm, which is a norm, political norm adopted by the General Assembly in September 2005, which has of course the use of force as ultima ratio, uh, and uh, which has been invoked explicitly in the declaration, in the resolution uh, on Libya in uh, March 2011. And we have a general sort of conditionality of sovereignty resulting even in security policy prescriptions and norms about intervention. Uh, this is very different from the use of force, of course, uh, that uh, the Pope spo speaks about in Parchimentaris. Now we come to the present, uh, 2013. What are the signs of the times? Uh, now I think we have to brace ourselves from, uh, for one of these shifts in the anarchy of international, uh, the international state system that we probably thought we had overcome. International affairs uh, is and remains uh, a system in a system of states which is anarchic. That is without any arche, without any, any uh, governance. There is nothing above, uh, apart from international law that is, lots of legal obligations, but there is no enforcement uh, and uh, there are many states that are, that are not uh, democracies. What we see now is a major change away from the unipolar order, so to speak, where the US has been predominant in economic and military uh, terms of power and uh, towards a multipolar system. My colleague Joseph Nye at uh, Harvard has written very much about soft power, hard power, how to combine sticks and sticks and carrots, so to speak. And in his book, The Future of Power, which is uh, in a way a silly title, but uh, he's trying to analyze how power develops in the international system. 
He says, today power in the world is distributed in a three-dimensional chess game. On the top chessboard, uh, military power remains largely un unipolar, and the US is likely to remain supreme for some time. On the, um, uh, but on the middle chessboard, economic power has been multipolar for more than a decade, uh, with the US, Europe, Japan, and China as the major players." End of quote. Now, polarity, uh, there is a psychiatric illness, of course, being bipolar. That's not what we talk about, although sometimes the world looks a bit uh, schizophrenic. But having different various poles of power means that there is an instability in the system. There's a balancing problem. And uh, the fact that these new great powers, China, Russia, uh, perhaps uh, India, uh, South Africa, many of these states are not, uh, they are much more marked by realpolitik than by the just peace, than by human rights. They are not liberal democracies, to put it quite bluntly. They are some kind of uh, state, uh, state uh, capitalist system, dictatorship, uh, and there are also states that are theocracies, especially in the Middle East and the Maghreb. So we see that uh, this march of just the just state, this development of just states as democracies, has halted considerably. And we also notice that no great power has ever foregone the possibility of developing economic power into military power, unfortunately. And we see this now. China, for 30 years, had not done much at all not even up, upgrading its nuclear capabilities, but built up its economic uh, income. Now China spends 11, has 11% 11 increase in the military budget each year. It's just incredible. Um, buying, getting aircraft carriers, new planes, uh, modernization, uh, and uses this military power in coercive diplomacy, gunboat diplomacy in the South China Sea. This happens uh, regularly uh, right now. And we see Russia also exercising, modernizing, and um, is willing to use power for national interest aims. It is not the use of power that we, I've talked about as humanitarian intervention, to use power only to stop something too terrible from happening, but it is the traditional statecraft of using power to promote national economic resource or other interests. And we don't know today whether a military power will again be used aggressively uh, in a state-to-state -state context. We simply don't know that. So we can't take Sort of the, the depressing thing about my uh, field of study is, of course, that you can't take any progress. There's no, unlike medicine or science uh, of other kinds, there is no uh, certain progress. What is the implication of this for the just peace human rights? Um, yes, there are some implications. Uh, we granted the Nobel Peace Prize. I don't say this all the time just because I come from this small place called Norway. So I have to mention the Nobel Peace Prize, but it's actually relevant. We used, uh, we gave it, or the co committee gave it to Liu Xiaobo of China, the dissident, in 2010. And he has not been seen since. He is imprisoned, his wife and, and brother also. Uh, China, the new great power economically, has used this, uh, this occasion to state, uh, to state the example to the rest of the world that sovereignty is not to be overridden by or be conditioned by human rights. There are no human rights that are universal. Uh, human rights are the same as whatever the Chinese legal system uh, at any one time decides. So the, uh, the person Liu Xiaobo, who is a criminal uh, according to Chinese law, is and remains a criminal, and we have given the Nobel Peace Prize to a criminal. The interesting thing is that uh, uh, this uh, sort of punishment of Norway continues now, where everything is cancelled in terms of economic agreements and contracts and visits and so on, uh, and this is very useful as a way of 
of underlining that the old sovereignty of Westphalia, so to speak, is back. Rex Imperator in Regno Su, the one who has the territorial power, has the power. This is sovereignty, the old formula. And the same view of sovereignty is very evident in Russia. Uh, NGOs are agents of foreign powers spying on the Russian regime. Uh, there is no dispersal, there's no pluralism or balance of power, no checks and balance. So we see this uh, as we speak, that great powers today are reverting to old-fashioned sovereignty notions and realpolitik. And we see this at the UN. The so-called Human Rights Council is a place where Ahmadinejad could discuss uh, blasphemy as a limitation on freedom of speech. It is a place where uh, one follows numerical democracy, of course, where the liberal demo democratic states are in a minority. And we also observe empirically that there's a decline in human rights conditionality. When we go to Africa and have this conditionality, China is there without conditionality. So one can, one can gather just uh, statements from uh, heads of government and, and officials that we don't really need your money that much anymore. You don't have power over us. And the economic crisis in my continent, as well as here, I think, but particularly in Europe, uh, means that one turns inwards towards uh, one's own problems. And uh, uh, there is, uh, in a way, no willingness to lead in international affairs. There is no leadership uh, exercised by any European power apart from France, Britain. France is the only state that really undertakes um, some intervention now in Mali to stop terrorism. Uh, France was behind the Libyan operation. Uh, without France, there wouldn't have been, um, been a humanitarian intervention in Libya. Uh, and uh, the Brits are working closely with the French. Uh, but we see now that uh, there's a sea change of US leadership in the world, and the US is, is uh, in a way saying, we are, in, we are engage, getting engaged where we have to, uh, not where we, in a way, it would have been useful uh, to, to go. And this is, for, from this humble perspective in, of international diplomacy, um, uh, we have, we have, um, oh, I have to return this. Yes, this is the way. Yes, uh, uh, from the humble perspective, in a way, of international diplomacy, stability uh, is something one could desire, uh, but it is not something one can, in a way, just take for granted. We could say progress, trying to sum up this, progress in 2013, 50 years hence. A major state-to-state -state war is now almost ruled out. Not entirely can ever be, but it is not longer a strategic scenario for NATO or I think for the US. Uh, that is because international affairs have changed. States are no longer interested in, uh, in uh, invasion. They are not uh, seeking domination of other states in that territorial sense, but they are nonetheless uh, concerned about balance of power, of uh, security, and so on. So we could say the interstate war has disappeared, uh, luckily, apart from some few cases. Uh, and technology has made it uh, much less dangerous that some states have nuclear weapons, or some states like North Korea and, and uh, possibly Iran. However, uh, the fact that many states have acquired such weapons and continue to do so is, of course, extremely uh, alarming because of accident or actually use uh, on a smaller scale. One cannot. Uh, uh, we don't know whether the interceptors and the technology will be able to fix things. But there are fewer and fewer interstate wars. Maybe Sudan, maybe Eritrea, Eritrea Ethiopia. But the world is on the overall uh, judgment much safer today. So absence of war, 
as peace, this sort of bottom line, uh, fares much better today than before. Yet we see the use of force for national interest. Again, this is the old way of, should one say, uh, international affairs returning, uh, the graduated, calibrated uh, use of force, coercive diplomacy, this kind of thing. Uh, soft power is not enough. Some cases here, and the Syrian civil war has now claimed 70,000 uh, lives, civilian lives, and there is no interest in even talking about Syria in international affairs, in Russia perhaps, but not in the US, not in Europe. And uh, this is very disconcerting from, a, should one say, a human rights perspective, that uh, human suffering is not important. Uh, the bottom line, if there is one, or the, the red line is the use of chemical weapons. Of course, the, that's a grave problem in Syria, but uh, they have large stocks of such weapons. But uh, there is no willingness to, in a way, uh, stand by the responsibility to protect or the human rights importance that we had so prominent in international affairs since 1990. And realpolitik, geopolitics, uh, the great power logic of Russia and China is very, very different from the conditional sovereignty and soft power of the uh, order that was created after World War II, the UN-based order. And uh, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, humanitarian issues, human rights issues, uh, not very important. We had um, um, not to repeat myself, but genocide and mass atrocity do not elicit any reactions today. Uh, despite uh, what we know about it, we know much more than ever before about what goes on be beyond the borders of individual countries. The Genocide Convention uh, was in fact written in 48, uh, and uh, the responsibility to protect was adopted now in 2005. Uh, but uh, Libya, I think, remains an exception. Uh, then I should also mention that uh, the, um, uh, the peace on Earth, uh, in terms of just states, states based on human rights, uh, that is entirely relevant to the problem of ungoverned states, states that are not repressive, but that are failed states, and uh, terrorism tends to move into these uh, open spaces, ungoverned spaces. And right now, for Europe, the Sahel, Mali, Libya, Sudan, uh, Somalia, and also Yemen, uh, very, very critical places where it is, uh, unless one engages somehow, there will be uh, a free-for-all, so to speak. Just an example of how human rights and security policy are <coughs> two sides of the same coin. In Egypt now, the human rights um, uh, declaration that was adopted at the women's conference of the UN recently, rest, um, sort of 10 uh, number of points about the rights of women, was then counted by the Brotherhood as absolutely unacceptable. Equality. Uh, divorce, inheritance for women, all these basic things that were also contested by Saudi Arabia in 1984. So I would say that human rights are now almost paradoxically or ironically at the very core of security policy in the world. There is no lasting peace without uh, democracy. There's, it's really true. There's no lasting peace. Uh, yet uh, in a way, the willingness and ability of states, uh, Western states in particular, to promote this agenda uh, and, and entertain the cost of it uh, is very low. There is an interest sort of isolationism almost developing instead. So in conclusion, um, the old question of the Pope's divisions uh, comes up. Stalin famously or infamously asked, as you know, how many divisions has the Pope? Uh, and he has, uh, you know, a company of soldiers. <laughs> That's not the answer, but you see the point. Uh, 
the power changes from the West to uh, China, Russia, and these countries is a grave uh, development if one thinks that the just peace is what should obtain in the world. If one does not say that it is fine if you just have dictatorships, they are at least stable, so that's how the world has always been. We can't have any, any opinions or intervene in uh, the affairs of other states. The form of government uh, is such a luxury, we can't entertain so that we can't have policy on that. We must accept Westphalian sovereignty. Westphalian sovereignty, when the treaties were written, uh, they, they were banned by the Pope, as you probably know, forever. They are null and void for eternity, uh, the Pope at the time declared in 1648. But Westphalian sovereignty goes with realpolitik, geopolitics, the old way of the world that we hoped that we had abandoned with the UN Pact and the UN Declaration. Uh, and when I, want to when I conclude now, in 2013, we are quite away from this uh, benign state of affairs of 1990-2000. Uh, we are into a new uh, sort of power distribution in the world and uh, soft power, power of attraction for U the U US and Europe is very much based on the economic ability to keep these societies going, to, to have the sort of uh, ability to project these things in the world. It is not attractive uh, to come to Europe these days because there are no jobs, no prospects and so on. So I have to, I think, uh, despite all this gloom, I have to end on an optimistic note and, uh, you know, as uh, P. P. Parchimenteris did certainly do that, and uh, I shouldn't uh, be too gloomy. So I want to end on this uh, question and the need, the opening, so to speak, uh, the window opportunity for moral authority. Because uh, uh, we know that uh, the little, sort of the power in the world that, uh, that the social teaching commands uh, is a moral authority. It doesn't rest on economic power, certainly not on military power, not on political power. Uh, it is the attraction of the uh, concepts and the view of man and the uh, and, uh, ethics or justice of the issues. So with the new Pope Francis, uh, I think we have the right man at the right time uh, in human history and uh, the Holy Spirit, empirical evidence of the working of the Holy Spirit, so to speak. So now is the time for the social teaching to be brought out uh, on the international stage very forcefully. Thank you so, so much.